Good evening, everybody. Um, there's a great tradition in our room of thanking the canon for the use of the hall. And standing up in this beautiful place, I'd just like to thank the Dean uh, for, for the fact that we all get a chance to be in this wonderful space every year at the festival. Thank you, Dean. Good evening, and welcome to the fifth lecture in the memory of Hubert Butler. Um, the man who's one of the founders of this wonderful festival week in the 70s would have been proud to see that once again the lecture in his memory has packed St. Canis's with people who are hungry to hear the truth, no matter how unpalatable that truth may be, to hear contrary views, no matter how contrary they may be. And many years ago, uh, my mother, who was a great admirer of Hubert Butler's, gave me his book of essays, Escape from the Anti. And I've struggled to keep it in the house ever since because everybody always wants to borrow it. So I'm glad to tell you that there's another book of Hubert Butler's on sale this evening, hot off the Limited Press. It's a second edition of 10,000 Saints, the book that Hubert spent, I think, 30 years on, and he considered it his most important work. The text has been updated by his son-in-law, Dick Crampton, from Hubert's own notes. And I'm told it's a fascinating marriage of Irish pagan and hagiographic legends and modern science. And it uses linguistics and the pattern of stories and surnames to establish links with ancient tribes. And as you know, many of you, uh, Trinity College has recently helped to confirm those patterns with modern DNA sampling and genome mapping. Um, now that's on sale at the bottom of the cathedral later on, we've been asked to say to you, if you're going to buy it, would you buy it and move on quickly, because they will be trying to move us out for the concert that's coming on. And also worth uh, looking forward to after Christmas, um, and I can vouch for this being really interesting, because I read it in its previous form as an Oxford University doctoral thesis on microfiche in my local library last year. There's dedication for you. Um, but it'll be coming out in book form from Oxford University Press, a new title, Hubert Butler and Southern Irish Protestantism, 1900 to 1991. And it's by chaplain and tutor at Oriel College, Robert Tobin. And it looks at the fate of Southern Protestants after Irish independence and the determination of people like Hubert Butler that Protestants would play their full part and must play their full part in the new Ireland. You can order this uh, at the back of the cathedral this evening. You'll find order forms there. It ain't cheap, but if you order it now, you're going to get a special 20% discount. Now to tonight's speaker. And just to say first that around 2005, I chaired a conference for the Irish Bankers Federation. We all have to make a living. And <laughs> towards the end of uh, a big panel discussion, that I was chairing, where all the banker economists, uh, with one honourable exception, agreed that everything was fine, everything was hunky-dory. And I said towards the end, listen guys, I'm no expert, but if I were you, I'd be really worried about the extent to which you have extended our wealth to property. I'm surprised that you're not worried about that. And they smiled at me, of course, as though I was a rather stupid five-year-old. And they told me that I had to remember that, of course, the money was lent against assets, they said, very patronizingly. But what I said if the assets fell in value, as they had in Britain in the 80s, and I got more indulgent smiles, and they said, yes, even if they fell by 20, 25%, it'll be all right, we can absorb them. And I was to look back on that incident uh, within a couple of years and remember an economist with whom I lived with saying something to me. He said, the most important thing that you need to know about any economist is who pays him. Well, we pay him, um, really, because he's a university professor and uh, he's done us a better service than his colleagues did the banks. But the problem was who wanted to listen to the bad news? Not most of his colleagues, when he warned in 2006 and 7 that property prices would fall by maybe 50% over the decade. Not Bertie Ahern, who in a thinly veiled reference to him in July 2007 said that sitting on the sidelines, cribbing and moaning, is a lost opportunity. I don't know how people who engage in that don't commit suicide. Well, Morgan Kelly didn't commit suicide. He does his work teaching economics in UCD, setting, so my daughter assures me, merciless standards for his students. 
And he emerges every so often like an avenging angel to give us a dose of reality, as he did again in May of the Irish Times. He warned then that we need to break free of the IMF EU bailout or face national bankruptcy. He's that rare breed, Hubert Butler was another such, who would tell the truth no matter how uncomfortable, who revel in the fray, who manage to deliver bad news with such flair and such verve that their rare appearances sell out weeks in advance like an Eric Clapton concert. So in this frightening week, with world markets in turmoil, US debt downgraded, EU leaders returning from holiday to deal with a deepening Euro crisis, would you fasten your seatbelts, please, and welcome to Professor Morgan Kelly. Irish Times article. He's not the Messiah, he's just a very naughty boy. <laughs> and I have to say I'm surprised seeing all of you here this evening that I feel that all I've done through this has been just state the obvious. But it is a big honour for me to be here this evening giving this Hubert Butler lecture. I'm a big fan of Hubert Butler's. I first came across a book of his essays 20 years ago called The Subprefecture of Hell's His Tongue and other essays. And I like books with strange titles swipe off this. And it, I'd never heard of Butler before, but it turned out to be fascinating. What really impressed me about it was the view of Irish history it portrayed. As you remember, back in the 80s, history was all about you know, the titanic national struggle, our nationalist heroes against the grinding heel of the English. And growing up here in the 80s, just seeing just the corruption, the failure of the society, this didn't seem very meaningful or true to me. But just reading Butler's essays on things like the fettered boycott, on the Tipperary witch burning, it seems to me this was a real view of Ireland, just of ordinary people, often being very evil, some of them being very good, but realistic. But what struck me in particular about Butler was his style. I don't mean style so much in the sense of you know, elegant sentences, balanced clauses, subtle punctuation, but in the sense of voice, the way his character came through. He came through as a person, tolerant, open-minded, but at the same time with a passion for intellectual honesty. You know, as somebody who, seeing other people lying, particularly powerful people lying, stood up and opposed them. And this comes out most strongly in the title essay of the book, The Subprefecture of Elvis Tongue, which, in which Butler describes, I think it occurred exactly 50 years ago, how the Catholic Church here started to go on about the how Croatian Catholics have been horribly oppressed, and Butler, who had been in Yugoslavia, pointed out that actually the Serbs there had been brutalized, massacred, and forced to convert by the Catholics. And in one famous incident, the papal nuncio literally flounced out in disgust. And to us, this is a air of Monty Python about it. But at the time, obviously, these were extraordinarily powerful people, and a very courageous person to go up against them. So as I say, I'm very, very honoured to give this talk to you here today. So what I want to talk to you about is the Irish economy. What happened, where we came from, where we are, and where we're going. So in the last 25 years, you all know, we've had a real roller coaster ride. We went from being an economic basket case in the 80s to international superstars in the 90s and back to basket cases now. So what happened? Through most of our history, the Irish state had been an unambiguous economic failure. At independence, no Irish incomes were above the Western European average. By the mid-1980s, our incomes had fallen to around half the European average. And even that dismal performance was only maintained through mass immigration. And then suddenly everything changed. Within a decade, we had converged to 
European average level of income, unemployment had more or less disappeared. And like most overnight miracles, this was decades in the making. Our transformation goes back at least to the introduction of free secondary education, expanding the university system in the early 70s, through the 80s where we finally realised we had to be competitive with the rest of the world, through devaluations in the early 90s. So we stopped making mistakes, we started to do things right, and we grew. And a lot of people say, oh look, this boom was a loser, and it just went, the benefits just went to rich guys. That is completely false. What the boom generated, particularly in the 90s, were jobs. Something that had never been available in Ireland in the past. And jobs transform people's lives. That you don't need social workers to do a social problem. People need jobs. Once people have jobs, they have self-respect. Like just being able to buy a car, take your family on holiday, buy toys for kids at Christmas, transforms people's views of themselves. And so Irish society was transformed in that period. At the same time, we no longer needed some outside enemies to explain why we failed. And at the time, obviously, relations with Britain started to thaw. We no longer needed to resent them. We no longer needed to blame them for what had happened to us. And I think it comes out most clearly in the writing of history. As I say, like Butler, I think, was very much a pioneer in this. But, say, if you take say, one of my favourite history books, of Irish books in Germany in the 1990s, Hart's book, The IRA and Its Enemies. Rather than portraying these guys as heroes, because they were, he, in his book he shows that these people were, as you would expect sensibly, just as cold-blooded killers as the blackened hands and auxiliaries they were fighting. Say, so another very notable history book, David Dixon's Oceans of Consolation about emigrants' letters back from Australia. And again, the tone of this book wasn't the traditional, we've been driven out of here by the English. Instead, it was a much more believable tone, saying, look, we were sorry to leave, but our lives in Australia are infinitely better than anything we could ever have enjoyed in Ireland. <laughs> Similarly, my colleague Cormac O'Brona, his book had done with Jews at the time of James Choice. Again, it's nothing about these titanic national struggles. It's just ordinary people just trying to live their lives. So, as I said, the 90s, I think, were an extraordinarily beneficial period for Irish society. The one group that did not benefit, okay, apart from the Catholic Church, which all committed suicide more or less independently, <laughs> were Irish politicians. So, as you all know, under our PR system, politicians rely on patronage. You're competing against people from the same party, so you have to have people go out, knock on doors, stick up posters, all these things. And in the past, how they operated was direct patronage for jobs and you know, being moved on local authority housing lists. The problem then is in the 90s, people suddenly had jobs. I said, the old work on might be able to get your son a job in the post office. That didn't matter, you already had a job in Dell. So politicians were left grasping for patronage, for patrons out there, for strong for clients out there. So, through the 90s, and by the end of the 90s, we had converged to ordinary European levels of income. There's no one point the wages were being driven up, competitiveness is starting to fall. So you might have expected that we would have just gone back to ordinary European levels of growth, we've grown two or three percent a year. Instead, we continue to grow at 6, 7, 8% a year. Basically what happened was we see from a competitive Australian boom into a gigantic housing boom. Usually in economies say, like Ireland through most of its history, you get about 5% of your national income from building houses. By the mid-2000s, this had risen to 15%. During 2006-2007, we were building half as many houses as Britain, which is 15 times our size. What caused this giant building? The immediate cause was the house prices had risen. Okay, house prices rose, so it was profitable to build houses. And so, we had, say, back in the mid-90s, a house in Ireland, say, new second-hand in Dublin, elsewhere, cost about four times the average industrial wage. By 2006, a new house cost ten times the average industrial wage. 
Okay, so wages in prison, but house prices are pretty much faster. And in Dublin, the average second-hand house cost 15 times the average industrial wage. So we had this huge explosion in house prices. The only reason that explosion occurred was through bank lending. Banks started giving out much bigger mortgages. Again, back then, mid-90s, and as you, many of you will remember, it was really hard to get a mortgage. And we'll give you little ones. The average mortgage was about three times average industrial income. And that had risen then by the mid-2000s. It had tripled to around nine times. So people were taking out these huge mortgages. So this represented a very large change for Irish banks. So in the past, they had always been very, very cautious by international standards. Say around the year 2000, most banks, say if you look at most industrialized economies, bank lending was about 80% of national income. And at that time, remember this was during our giant industrial boom, lending in Ireland was only about three quarters of that. Okay, so our big boom in the 90s, a real boom, occurred without bank lending. That all changed around 2000. That everywhere banks found they could borrow in international markets at very low rates of interest. So if you look at average industrial economies, they went from lending being about 80% of national income to around 100%. But in Ireland, we went from 60% to 200% of national income. So bank lending more than tripled in the space of about six years. And everything that happened here flowed from that. So banks then found themselves in a situation, they had a traditional problem with how to ration money how to turn people down. Now they found themselves in a position where they couldn't find enough people to borrow from them. That any time they got someone to borrow, they would get a bonus. So there was a borrow this money internationally, lend it out to people, but not enough people wanted houses. So they found a new market in the form of property developers. The property developers were willing to take any loans they would give, so banks would lend money to them. These guys would bid against each other and build, bid up prices against each other. And this was pioneered by Anglo-Irish. That traditionally, lending to developers was a very, used a very risky form of lending. Okay, don't lend more to a developer than you would like to lose. But Anglo changed that, and Bank of Ireland and AIB very foolishly followed suit. And so we ended up in a situation by 2007, banks were lending, had lent about 115 billion to developers. That's 40% more than they were lending to everybody in Ireland in the year 2000. And this lending to developers then turned out to be a big boom for Irish politicians. That developing every part of the world is a very political activity. It involves not going around getting planning and permission, dealing with politicians. But this is particularly so in Ireland. That as you all know, our planning laws here don't exist to ensure rational land use. It's simply as a means of ensuring backsheesh for local politicians. But basically, you can build anything, anywhere, so long as you pay the right amount to the right people. So, this was suddenly happy days for Irish politicians. They formed this symbiotic relationship with developers. And at the same time, these developers were providing jobs. The problem with the boom of the 90s was very much restricted to large cities. Even sort of smaller cities like Waterford, say Kilkenny, got left out. But the building boom created jobs right through rural Ireland. So everybody was a winner. Problem with this though, the one flaw in the scheme was you had to keep on lending larger and larger amounts. That you had house prices were driven up completely by bank lending. Nothing to do with rising incomes, nothing to do with it, purely bank lending. So banks were in a situation where people were buying property solely to have its value rise. And in order to do that, they needed people to take out large and larger loans. And this then, they started to run into problems a lot earlier than people think. By late 2006, the number of more new mortgages were taken out had started to fall. And this was something that had surprised me. I got interested in the Irish property market around that time. And I got interested by accident. I'm sort of an academic economist. Say I, I do sort of theoretical economics usually. But what happened was watching the TV news all the time, these people calling themselves bank economists started to appear 
and say there's going to be a soft landing in the property market. And most of these guys are former students, man. But they, they said this soft landing so often, I became curious about what's going on. And so then I started to look at property booms, like, like places like North Finland and the Netherlands, and realize all oh, these property booms always end in tears. But I'd always been curious, how did these guys know there was something wrong in the market at the end of 2006? And the reason, the reason I now know is that lending had started to fall. People weren't taking out mortgages. People were getting scared that property was overvalued. So these guys were pushed out by their employers to basically tell lies, get you people to keep on buying houses. So cracks started to appear at the end of 2006. So this was bad news then. Lots of stuff was still getting built. Like we were building still at a record rate, but the stuff wasn't getting sold. So that meant that developers started to run into trouble. And banks were able to disguise this for a while, say they, were still, they could still borrow internationally. So they were in a situation with lenders who couldn't repay Anglo, but Anglo was still giving about more loans to buy more stuff. Like this. It's sort of like going on in Greece right now, or us for that matter. But, so by the summer of 2007, the government was actually worried about Anglo. They talked to ECB, the ECB said, not our problem, as usual. In February 2008, the Department of Finance wrote a memorandum based on how to wind up Anglo and inflict the cost on the bond holders. But this was all pretty much ignored. The banks were just able to go on pretending things were great, borrowing more money, lending more money, till the autumn of 2008, and they were the rainbow's crisis, and everything collapsed. And as you all know then, you had Anglo went under. So if we look then at this big lending boom and property boom, what we see immediately is who is responsible for it. It was the senior management of the Irish banks. In particular, AIB and Bank of Ireland. At any stage, they could have gone along to the government and said, Anglo were out of control, you need to stop them. Instead, they imitated Anglo. They tried to poach developers from Anglo. So, the, all of the blame lies with them. Certainly, there were problems with regulation here. But even if you look at somewhere like the US, where regulators are not morons, they had banking problems. There were certainly other problems with auditors, with rating agencies, but ultimately, it's the duty of the management of any company to make sure it survives, that it doesn't follow a suicidal strategy. And these guys failed in this. And obviously, this conclusion is very different from what you read in the Holman Report. Like, Holman Report is just mistakes were made. This is a grammatical style known as past exonerative tense. <laughs> mistakes were made, but not by anybody in particular. Even worse, even more sickening, was the later Nyberg report. Nyberg's view was thought this was just a social mania in Irish society. You know, it was just group think everybody got carried away. That's not true. It was the senior management of Irish banks, most of whom are still in their jobs. So, as you know then, Anglo went under in September 2008. This led to a big panic. There was a late night meeting. At the end of it, the government came out with this outrageous guarantee. They basically said, more or less all of the bonds that these banks have issued to borrow in international markets, we're going to guarantee these. Why they made this decision has never been very clear. My own guess is that it was some sort of combination of desperation and bravado. This was basically Cowan and Lennon's idea of shock and awe. Like, oh, we'll put the entire resources of the Irish state behind the banking system and that will frighten these speculators once and for all. Unfortunately, it turned out to be shocking and awful, but not quite in the way these guys anticipated. I would reckon that they probably thought, okay, maybe Anglo, Anglo's bad, it may be owes five, ten billion. It's easier just for the state to pay that off, rather than have a complete restructuring of the banking system. But we don't really know what happened. However, the real estate was not making the guarantee. At any stage, they could have come out and said, oh, look, we didn't know the state of the banks at the time. We were in a panic, we weren't well advised, we weren't completely sober at the time. But they stuck with it. And in particular, 
What happened was Patrick Conan took over as head of the central bank, and effectively, the government became the government's chief e e economic advisor. And he was a respected banking economist. He could have walked away from it. He could have said, okay, we're going to restructure the banks. All the outstanding bonds, all the money they owe, is going to be turned into shares. Now. And so that was the end of the bank debt. It would have cost us more or less nothing. But he said, no, the loss is unmanageable. So last, let's say May of last year, they had a so-called stress test. They said, oh, look, oh, how much do we think these banks are going to lose? And at the end of this whole said, oh, it's about 40 billion. And that was mad. At the time, like, you could see it even on the face. Like, Holland's reasoning was, okay, Anglo and Nationwide lost 35 billion. AIB and Bank Art are basically fine. They've only lost a few billion. However, if you look at the lending of these guys, that between them, AIB and Bank of Ireland had got the same exposure to developers as Anglo had. And they may actually lend to worse developers. They've been trying to catch up with Anglo. So if Anglo had lost 35, you could reckon that AIB and Bank of Ireland have also lost 35, even before we start thinking about mortgages. But anyway, he said, it's fine. So what happened was that we went on repaying bond holders. And this culmination in September of last year, where we repaid over 50 billion. That was like the big outstanding tranche of bonds. And not surprisingly, a few weeks after that, we went bust. International capital markets stopped lending to the Irish government, and we had to go along to the EU and the IMF for a bailout. And I think underlying this, I think Honan and the government may have felt, okay, they're going to give us easy terms. That all the time, like through the 90s, we've been the good kids, and we've now been in a situation, oh, look, we've, we've repaid all your banks that have lent to our banks here at enormous expense here. We're good kids, you'd be nice to us. Unfortunately, at this time, Greece had also come out. There'd been a murder that oh, Greece was cooking the books, basically a no-tax system. And also, more worryingly at the time, the EU were afraid that Spain was going to go under. So they made an example of us. They set these draconian terms in order to fight the Spanish. And it worked that Spain went and they reduced their deficit drastically. So that was a success. But we were left hanging up by the thumbs. That for all practical purposes, we have ceased to exist as a sovereign entity. We are now a sort of EU protectors. There is a Hungarian university lecturer called Istvan Skelly, and he is essentially the EU proconsul in Dublin. Anything the government wants to do, they go along and they talk to him. And it's a strange guy. Like if, if he doesn't like what they're saying, he stands up and shouts at them and wags his finger at them. It's like, it's like primary school, but very odd. But that is anyway, that this is where we've ended up. Like this is, for us, the war is over. And so what has happened is we have now become part of the larger EU sovereign debt crisis. And the first thing we need to bear in mind about this is we have to say, okay, is this just a liquidity problem? Are we just going through a phase where markets are a bit nervous? Unfortunately, we're not. We're insolvent. We owe more money than we can realistically repay. Right now, the official government estimate is that by 2015, we will owe about 200 billion euros. That would be our national debt. into the banking system. So we put in a gigantic amount of money. But I think this estimate is too optimistic. Say, so around the time Homer was saying, okay, we the loss around 40 million. I made our little spreadsheet, simple spreadsheet, and I reckon on that, that the loss will be around 80 billion, cost the Irish taxpayer. And just as the central bank is not more pessimistic, I have become more pessimistic. I now think the losses are going to be in the region of 90 to 100 billion, which means we're going to end up with a national debt of around 240, 250 billion by 2015. There's no way we can repay that. What has made me more pessimistic? The first thing is developer loans. I assume that banks would lose about three quarters of what they're lending to developers. And how I went about figuring this out, very simple, was that if you bought, say, an office block at the peak of the boom, 
the rate you will get will be about 2% each year of what you paid for it. That was your yield. And internationally, international property investors need a return of about 8%. So in order for these guys to come in and buy up stuff, we need price to fall by about 75%. But the stuff that these international investors are interested in is mostly office blocks in the centre of Dublin with sitting tenants. When we think of all the other so-called assets out there, things like you know, ghost estates, empty retail parks, land banks around the Carrigan Channel, all these things, these things are more or less worthless. In addition, even if you say you wanted to buy a retail park in Longford, you wouldn't be able to get the money to do it. As we said at this earlier, all these prices were driven by bank lending. There is no bank lending going on now for all practical purposes, so these, there are going to be very big falls in these developer loans. In addition, there seems to be a very large amount of fraud going on. That there are any number of cases around, you hear about if you talk to bankers privately, people who took out four or five loans on the same property. Again, like our property registration is very dodgy. They could do this, but that's also going to be a problem. But what worries me increasingly are mortgages. And in particular, there's a group of mortgages given out, interest-only mortgages, which were given out to professionals, to lawyers, solicitors, estate agents, at the peak of the bubble. And about 10,000 of these were given out. And this seems trivial, like 10, 000, there are three fourths of a million mortgages out there. Why should you care about 10,000 of them? However, it turns out these mortgages were for properties of one to two million euros each. So these guys will put up about 20% of the price. So 10,000 of these loans are about 1.1 million each, which means there's about 11 billion in loans to these high rollers from the boom, most of whom could barely buy you a cup of coffee now. So when I was thinking about how much the banks would lose, I reckoned, okay, banks will get back about half on any mortgages that default. And I based that on the US. And the US is very different from us. It's very easy to boot people out of their houses. Here, fortunately, it's very hard. But even when you do get people out, you have to sell the property. And the question is, how much would banks get if they tried selling off foreclosed properties? We know that prices have fallen by around 50% now. But that is, pre that is a pretty artificial level. The price we've got now is not a real market price. There are almost no transactions taking place at that price. What's happening is banks are giving out a handful of mortgages right now to basically people like me, so our senior civil servants, to give the appearance that prices are, say, down about 50%. The reason they're doing this is that if they didn't give these mortgages out, prices would completely collapse. And the more prices fall, the more people go into negative equity, the more likely they are to default on the mortgages. So right now we've got this sort of artificial floor on prices. But all the time, unsold properties are continuing to accumulate. It's not clear how long they'll be able to do this. At any stage, as this euro crisis develops, they may be stopped from lending completely on new mortgages. We'll go back to a cash market, and prices will fall hugely. The thing we need to remember, ultimately, is there is no real equilibrium price, no fundamental price for property. It's driven by waves of optimism and pessimism. A few years ago, okay, prices were rising, you had to get in early before prices became too expensive. So you pay a lot. Now we're in a situation, prices are falling, you can wait. You wait a year or so, see how much they fall, everybody does this, and that causes prices to fall more. So by their nature, property markets are very volatile. So we are very far, some people are coming out and saying, the same people who told me we'd have a soft landing, and sort of troll out into public again. And they're saying, oh, we've bought from that. We most certainly have not. We're very far from the bottom of the property market here. The next problem that banks face with their mortgages is organized opposition to repayment. Already, I've had three emails from different people setting up don't repay your mortgage organizations. So far, these are pretty small, disorganized, inchoate groups. 
But in time, it's quite possible some Michael David figure will emerge to organise and energise these groups, and they will become a major problem for the banks. And on top of this, then, there is always a risk of paramilitary intervention. That for these dissident Republicans, one way of gaining support is these sort of Robin Hood style actions against these so foreign banks who are oppressing us. I've heard of one case a few years back where a bank repossessed some land bought by a border area businessman, using that word in almost its Russian sense. And the estate agent handling this transaction found an explosive device in the office. And you can see there's plenty, given our sort of history of sort of paramilitary violence and agrarian terrorism as a pastime, this is quite possible that this will re-emerge. So I think all in all then, banks are facing big, big losses, and that means big losses for all of us. So I think that we are going to end up with a national debt by 2015, easily 240 billion. The next problem we have then with the banking system is even if we go and put, pay off all the losses of the banks, we're going to have to put in new capital into the banks so they can continue to operate. And the government says, OK, no, they're just, they're just putting in 24 billion right now in capital. This is going to be enough. It's not. Okay? There are big losses out there. The way we can tell it's not enough is that if a bank has enough capital, other banks will lend to it. That's the acid test. And other banks will not lend to Irish banks. But so suppose then the government puts in, say, an extra, they pay off all the losses, they go in and pay, say, put in 15 billion new capital into Irish banks. Can they then go and sell the banks for 15 billion? That's what you would imagine. The problem is they can't. Irish banks became huge during the boom. Irish banks are now about three times the size they should be. So for an economy the size of Ireland, our banking system should cost us they total operating expenses should be about one and a half billion a year. Between them, AIB and Bank of Ireland, say forget about Anglo, EBS, all the others, their annual operating expenses are four and a half billion. Okay? So unless we're going to go and fire two thirds of the staff off the banks, these things will not be profitable. We will not be able to sell them all. So these will remain as loss making gold plated in selling states. And this actually opens up very interesting vistas for Irish politicians. So as you said right through the talk, Irish politics is about patronage. That we had, first of all, no, you had the ordinary foot soldiers, they went. Then you had developers. And I think so, uh, with developers, I think they, my big image of this is not the Bally Brick tent, which I think most people have, but the election before last. All the election coaches were put up by builders, like guys in car hats and high-vis jackets, like by leading developers. But these guys have all gone now. So what's going to replace it? And I think the banks as semi-states will. It opens up huge areas of patronage. You are now going to have politically appointed boards on these banks, and they are going to decide who gets a loan and on what terms. More importantly, in the situation we're in, these politically appointed bank boards will be able to decide who gets relief on their mortgage, who gets the mortgage written off entirely, and who gets their booted out of their houses. So as I say, this opens up this is a patronage that Charlie Hawking wouldn't even have been able to dream of. And I think it is going to be a complete game changer in Irish politics in the future. But anyway, so here we are, we're insolvent with Greece. We are now part of the bigger Eurozone debt crisis. And I think what is interesting about this crisis is that it was allowed to develop, as it has. But obviously, if it had been stopped, if they come along and said, OK, Greece and Ireland can't pay back, we are going to have to come up with money, and we will give this, and we will end the crisis. That would have been the end. So that's why economists use the term contagion to describe the spread of fear in financial markets. Most metaphors in economics are pretty misleading, but the contagion one is exact. 
It's like public health. You've got one person who's infected. If you don't treat them quickly, they spread it to everyone else. It becomes much harder. And this is what's happened. Greece and us were left untreated. Oh, Greece and the Irish will eventually be paid money. But we're now in a situation where Portugal's gone under and Spain and Italy are looking very shaky. As are Greece and, Greece and Belgium are moving up. Sorry, that Belgium and France are moving up very rapidly. But as I say, what is surprising is that he was let to happen. That if we think back 25 years ago to Germany, the Germans would not have wanted to go and punish the Greeks and us by extension. Something has fundamentally changed in the EU and in Germany. That it goes back to the origin of the EU after the Second World War. That you have for 300 years in Europe, you have increasingly assertive nation states having bigger and bigger wars with each other, ending up in the catastrophe of the First and Second World Wars. And Germans found themselves in a situation after the war where they were terrified of two things of the Russians who obviously got to petition their country, and also of themselves, of what they had done. And the perfect solution for them was to become part of this European group to basically submerge their national political identity. And part of that involved being very nice to the peripheral guys like us. This was a way, so handing out money to us in the 80s and 90s was a way of saying to themselves in Germany, oh look, we've changed, we've become nice. But also, particularly the East Europeans were still part of the Warsaw Pact, saying, look, Germany is different now. But all that changed. So if this crisis had happened 25 years ago, said, oh look, the Greeks and the Irish are in trouble, the immediate German response would have been, we need to end this immediately. And they would have. But what changed in the meantime was, first of all, German unification. You had the disappearance of the Soviet Union, Germany reunified. You also had then the whole generation of German politicians who lived through the carnage of the Second World War all dying off. So Germany just became a normal democratic society, able to go and act unpleasantly to other countries, stupidly towards other countries, and nobody would bar the Daily Telegraph thinking it was sinister. <laughs> An extra factor with the change in German view towards Europe was the Euro. As you all know, Germans hate the Euro. However, it has been an extraordinary benefit to the German economy. Germany's growth in the last decade has been based on exports to Mediterranean Europe. Okay, it became highly competitive in the 90s. And it has essentially destroyed the manufacturing sectors of Greece, Spain, and Italy. And so like a lot of the social unrest you see there among, in these places, you see among young people, is the fact that their jobs basically moved to Germany in the last 10 years. So the euro has been this gigantic benefit to Germany. But Germans hate it. And their view is, oh, we've got all these layabout Greeks that we're subsidizing in this system here. It's led Germans basically to I have a feeling of disdain towards Mediterranean Europe. Like, we're these hard-working guys here, we're productive. You've got these feckless Mediterraneans here that we're subsidizing. So all these things between them have meant that there's been this political paralysis within Europe. This has meant, then, that the crisis has been taken over by the ECB. And the ECB is an extraordinarily strange institution. Most central banks are just set up, bang, immediately, when the country is set up. The ECB started out as a thing called the European Monetary Institute in Frankfurt in the 1990s. And at that time, nobody suspected that the EMI was going to amount to anything. It was just turned into another sort of League of Nations. So very few people were willing to go there and start careers in the place. Typically, the people who went there were people with no middle-aged guys with sort of family problems and who wanted to live in Frankfurt, for goodness sake. <laughs> so, but, the result was that these people then rose by seniority in the ECB. So we now have these very, very low quality people supposedly running the show. So when you hear the ECB saying, oh look, the big problems facing Europe right now is inflation, this is where it's coming from. 
And so the situation has spun entirely out of control. That's saying we're now in a situation known that Italy and Spain are on the edge, that over the last few days the problem has gotten huge. I think eventually it will be solved. That simply the Eurozone is too complex to collapse. Just the logistics of undoing the Eurozone, especially for us, that we've got say 160 billion of European deposits in Irish banks. What happens to those if the euro disappears? It's a nightmare. But I think ultimately what will keep it going is the fact it is in Germany's benefit. If Germany goes back to an independent currency, it will appreciate through the roof. German exports will be killed off. So I think at some stage what we're going to see is very large European central bank loans to Ireland and Greece and then other ones to Spain and Italy. At this stage, like this sort of expansion of this EFSF thing over where you have to have seven new power and vote and they all come back on their summer holidays. That's not going to happen. That's happening too slowly. Okay, so in a communist mode then, assume we get through the euro crisis and we are eventually given some sort of soft blow. For example, suppose they might lend us 100 billion for 50 years at 1% interest. And that would be the end of the problem for us. We could then go and borrow again in regular banking markets. Even if we get through that, we have very deep problems in Ireland still. <coughs> that the whole banking crisis and government borrowing crisis have taken attention away from very deep, pretty much intractable problems in the rest of the Irish economy. Our first problem is mortgage indebtedness. You know, there are tens of thousands of people out there who took out loans they can't afford. There's no way for the government to bail these people out. Like the banks are broke, the government is broke. It's going to be hard. Eventually, I think we'll reach some system where some people will get their mortgages reduced. Other people will be allowed just to walk away from their houses and not be pursued for the outstanding balance. But it's going to be hard. And as I say, I think it is going to be a very politicized process. So I think for any of you who would like your mortgages reduced, in the next few years, who doesn't? At this stage, you might do well to join Fine Gael, and if hedging your bets, maybe Sinn Féin, or whatever, also, whatever hard right party emerges, like you could find a party card or a loan number is going to be a big financial asset in the future to you. Next problem then is unemployment. Okay, employment in Ireland has fallen by one sixth already, and it's still falling. And in particular, we have among young males, males 20 to 24, fewer than 50% of them are now in work. Okay, this is a gigantic social problem that we're going to have to face. These are guys who left school early to get jobs on buildings, very poorly educated. We have to do something about them. Next problem we face is Irish indigenous companies. Obviously, we hear all the time about American corporations, and they certainly account for most of our exports. But most employment here, very few people work for these foreign corporations. Most people work for Irish companies. And Irish companies are going under at an accelerating rate. In solvent season, in the first six months of this year, were higher than corresponding periods last year or the year before. You have these Irish companies which are hanging on by their fingernails for the last two or three years, and they're going under. And a particular problem they face is property loans. And obviously people who run companies tend to be more into making money than regular people. That's why they set up companies. It's, very, it's a very good thing. But the way to make money in Ireland in the last 10 years was by borrowing and buying property. And that is sinking these companies. So I was talking to one guy in a bank and he was saying, oh look, we're perfectly happy to lend to small businesses. There are lots of great businesses out there we'd love to lend to them. As soon as they repay us, so five million they borrowed to buy the apartment block or the land bank or whatever. And the next problem we face is the international economy. That is going bad very quickly. So Britain had a housing boom similar to ours. They, they seem to be getting over it. Now they seem to be sinking again. But obviously the US is the real frightening one. That this recent deal between Obama and the Republicans is only catastrophic. That the US faced two problems. 
first problem is that it was in a very deep recession, which means you need to expand government spending. The second problem they face is that in the medium term, their debt is rising because their taxes are too low and because their health costs are out of control. And this deal that Obama struck, basically Obama said, OK, I will meet the Republicans halfway. So people who don't believe in evolution, don't believe in global warming, don't believe in government deficits, I will go more than halfway to meet these guys. So the result is we are now, they are now cutting government spending in the short run which will quite likely push the US back into recession. And they are doing nothing about the long-term problems of low taxes and high house costs. And obviously, as the US goes under, that hits us very, very badly. So these are all the problems we face. Ultimately, the way we are going to get out of it, out of this situation, is, as we were before, we have to have a better educated workforce than everybody else. Unfortunately, probably the single most depressing piece of data I came across in the last year, the most depressing statistic, was not about the banking system or the government. It was about the performance of Irish kids on the PISA tests. Okay, PISA are these international standardized aptitude tests given to 15-year-old kids. And on the mathematics test, Irish kids came, among the sort of more prosperous economies, the OECD economies, Irish kids came pretty much last. Okay, we are at the bottom of international mathematical achievement among more affluent economies. And this is not a statistical blip. I can see it teaching in universities. We have these very weak kids coming in now. We can't fail these kids anymore. We have to keep them on. We have to pass them. So say in our second year sort of mathematics course in economics, if you ask, okay, x over 5 equals 2, what's x? About 20% of the class can't answer that. Okay, that's the situation we're at. We have dumbed down our education system. Unfortunately, the rest of the world hasn't. We've given up. Okay, there's all this talk about the smart economy, but we have. The rest of the world hasn't. So they, these are big problems for us. So what I'm talking about this evening is what's happened to us in the last few years. But I think what is significant, what people overlook very often, is that this is not the first economic disaster we've had. This is not the first time that things have been okay and we've then gone and shot ourselves in the foot. Since the Second World War, we have actually had three disasters. We had the 1950s, the 1980s, and now what we're going through here. It seems every 30 years, we go and we destroy ourselves. And I think there's something more than coincidence going on. You could, could be the fact we're a small place, okay? We have a limited pool of talent. You can certainly see this in the Department of Finance and the Central Bank. <laughs> but no, even, even that, that wasn't, but, I don't know, that came out a bit harder than I meant it, I don't know. But, but say, for example, if you say, look at, say, the Irish insurance regulation, the problems that the insurance regulation faces are not that drastically simpler than what his German counterpart would face. But he obviously has a much smaller pool of resources to deal with it. That said, if you look at the insurance regulation, that we've had the collapse of quit insurance. That would only cost us a billion. But what you have to remember is that was a carbon copy of the collapse of PMPA in the 1970s. Again, you have some guy sets up an insurance company, confuses premiums with profits, and goes under. So we seem to be committing the same mistakes over and over again. But I don't think it is smallness. So if you look, there are lots of successful small economies there. You've got the Nordics, you've got Singapore, you've got New Zealand. And I think what distinguishes these economies is this feeling that they are on their own, that they have to really scramble to survive. If they're not the best, they're going to sink. And for a while, we were like this. I think for a brief, shining moment in the 90s, it seemed people in Ireland could get ahead on the basis of their own intelligence and abilities, and family connections and patronage no longer mattered. But these gombeans who had run the country, 
for themselves in the past who thought they'd gone, but they were just hiding. They re-emerged more powerful than ever during the construction boom. And I think our deeper problem is, it's not so much a tolerance of corruption so much as an understanding of human frailty. The idea is, oh look, if we were Sean Fitzpatrick, well maybe we'd have done the same. There's this sort of reluctance to cast the first stone. And in a small place like this, struggling to survive, an outlook like this is catastrophic. And so, as this crisis continues to worsen, and it, it is getting worse, okay, as I say, employment is still falling, businesses, business failures are still increasing. I think we're going to face a choice as a society. Either we can go on business as usual, that older people, like most of the audience here like me, will continue to enjoy very pleasant jobs. Our kids, unfortunately, they're going to end up, no temporary contracts, emigrating with third-rate educations. In other words, we're going to sort of go for pretty much the way of Italy. And it sort of reminds me of the, the sort of famous exchange between Churchill and De Valera. Like, you know, Churchill said, oh, like, that during the early Second World War, Churchill said, oh, look, things for us are serious, but not hopeless. And De Valera replied, oh, well, for us, things are hopeless, but not serious. And that's always summed up the attitude of the Irish political class. Things are great for us and for our pals. And you can see this with the new government. It's hard to realise we've actually had a change of government. We're just blindly going along. The alternative we face is we toughen up. We say, look, in order to be a decent society, we do have to be better educated. We have to be completely intolerant of corruption. We have to be fighting all the time to st stay one step ahead. And I have a bad feeling which one we're going to choose, but the choice is ours. I think we are going to be facing it soon. So thank you all very much. international financial situation is getting much worse and the government has no appetite for this. So look, being realistic, we're stuck there. We just have to just know, be nice kids and hope they treat us nicely. I'm afraid. Well, if that's what you like. Uh, <laughs> okay, and we take, uh, we take a few questions together, yes? Have we got somebody down there with the microphone? Yeah? Could you hand the microphone to them? Thank you. Yes? Uh, thanks for a very interesting lecture. Um, I, I'd like to coin a phrase that was recently used. Do you not think you're being a little excessively pessimistic? We all acknowledge there was, we, we binged on property and we're suffering a wicked hangover. But it, like everything else, will end. And I think you've ignored some of the international factors that led to our disaster. The other thing is, to give us some faith for the future, if you look at the sectors in our economy that are booming, that haven't been at all impacted, the ICT sector, the fund sector, the pharma, the chemical areas, the agri-sector, all these provide a huge way forward, and I think you sort of glossed over them slightly. Okay, is there, there was a hand behind you there, maybe we could take that point as well. Uh, man with the hand up behind you, yeah. And we just take a few points together, because we don't have a lot of time. Okay. Right, yeah. Yes, Professor. In the Irish Times article that we stated, words uh, to the effect that uh, why should the state borrow money in order to pay me double the salary that I'm entitled to, me and the likes of it. And you seem to have joined now a consensus that you 
and many like them in the cosy jobs, as we call them, should stick being paid by borrowed money. And would you have a suggestion as to what you are going to do about that? Okay, we take those two together. There's a young man with his hand up here, and then we go to him in a moment. But Morgan, the first point, you're being excessively pessimistic. Okay, uh, in general, I know I have this reputation as being this sort of uber bear, this arch pessimist. But honestly, I never expected things to turn out nearly as badly as they did. <laughs> and in particular, I never imagined that we would end up completely insolvent with daylight. And so I hope I'm wrong about the things I've, I've said this evening, as I always hope I'm wrong. Okay, I'm just saying what I think. I'm not saying this is the truth. This is my opinion. It's true. We do have successful sectors in the economy. The problem is that in terms of employment, they're small. And there doesn't seem to be very much scope for expansion of those. And I think in the longer run, we are going to need more sectors like this, but we are going to need educate an educated workforce for that, and I think we're letting ourselves down. Regarding, do I deserve a pay cut? Yes, I unquestionably do. Like, there is no question, in any crisis like we're in, the best of must take the hit. Like, we do need to be in a situation, civil servants like me, with complete security of jobs, need to be paid less. And at the same time, then we do need to raise our taxes. Our tax rates, particularly on highly paid people, are too low. Okay, uh, young man here in the front, could we give him a microphone, please, and let him ask his question? Yep, yeah. off you go. Uh, I own a uh, personal interest. What do you think of Bertie Ernst's comment? <laughs> What's that? Bertie Ernst's comment about suicide. Yeah, what do you think uh, about that? Um, I didn't think very much about it. That I think the, the nature of doing this stuff is you are going to have a lot of people attack you. It was something that surprised me at first when I wrote pieces. I suppose I'm just so clueless, I didn't expect to oh, this is what's going to happen. And I was surprised that people reacted so strongly. But it's ultimately, you have to say, look, there are people in life that you respect and their opinions you respect, and others whose opinions you don't really respect. And I have to say, unfortunately, Bertie would not be someone I, I would be really care about. Public service to pay to pensions. Or somebody could buy this country for 20 cents. Uh, I saw in the FT recently that mentioned that um, Brazil should absorb Portugal as a, as a province <laughs> and take over. So, who is it possible that somebody could buy this country? Who might want to? Why would they want to? Would that solve the problem? Thank you very much. And, uh, there's a person down there. You get a microphone. Uh, yeah, keep your hand up for a second and we get the microphone um, to you. But in the meantime, Morgan, would anybody be interested in buying us? I don't know. I, think, I never had any talent as an estate agent. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. That, that's one question I cannot answer. Who would want this place? <laughs> I suppose you could rejoin the UK, but I'm not sure they want the back. Okay, you yeah. Thanks, Kevin. The question I want to ask is, the public sector contracts when they're handed out, there are a lot of stoppages and outages for people's wages for six funds, you name it. But when people go there for the draw their entitlements, there's no money there for them. What can be done about that? The very sore issue would be, and my colleagues. Thank you. Right, you're saying that there are, I didn't quite catch the point, that there are, there's no money for what? I'll, I'll rephrase the question again to you, Chairman, a Chairperson. When public sector contracts are handed out to other contractors, sick funds, pensions, you name it, uh, are being stopped out of people's wages, or when people go for the draw those six, six funds, you name it, there's no money there. What can be done about that? Thank you. Okay. Okay, it's 
it's it's a real big problem. I think, I think it's, it's a more general problem than what you're saying. It's just we have this thing of people making contributions and saving up for their old age and suddenly disappearing. And say it's not only people, I'd say, the situation you've said, but also say people who bought bank shares. All these people put savings into this, and these things have disappeared. And I think, like, I'd say a, a public servant, I, I actually pay into my pension as an academic, but I would be very dubious I will receive very much of it ultimately. And it, it, it is, it, it is just part of the way that we have all been ripped off as a, a, as a society. Well, send us all home happy. Tell us how bad it's going to get in terms of economics, uh, social situation, politically. Oh, it's... I mean, I, I think oh. we're going to lose total trust and, and, and respect for politics, or we're going to some new sorts of political parties. Well, I'm afraid of that. That I think there is... That I think as the economy continues to deteriorate, the current government could end up as unpopular as the previous one. And that case, we have used up our last two constitutional parties. And so I think there could be openings. I think Sinn Féin will take the running on the left. I think there's probably an opening on for some hard right sort of party there, which is sort of scary. Like, again, I, I hope I'm wrong, that we are in a situation that we do have a big tradition of democracy here. And I think that's why we have not had any sort of public protests. And it's something that surprises me about journalists. Journalists seem disappointed that we haven't had riots in people's houses in Burkina. But I think that's actually a positive thing. But I, I do believe that uh, there will be a lot of bitterness here. This thing is going to go on and on. This thing is not going to be over in a year or two. I think typically when you have a big credit bust like this, you're talking about a decade at least for, for the economy to recover. And I think things are going to be hard during this time. Okay, that's your seatbelts for 10 more years. I just want to thank Morgan Kelly for a fascinating uh, discussion. Cheer everybody up. So, by your books, don't hang around. Morgan Kelly.